This chart explains your life in more ways than you can possibly imagine, because AI was supposed to enhance your job. And instead, it's being used to squeeze every drop of labor out of you for the same paycheck. He has not stopped working for a second. At 12.45, he sneezed while keeping his eyes open. So this line is productivity, how much dollar value the average human produces and how much that has grown over time. Now, it should be bound to grow a lot more with AI now, right? But there's another line and there's a problem because this is how much we are getting paid for that production. Now that was, of course, America's chart. And America's chart is a little different from everybody else's. This is Canada, this is the UK, this is Germany, Spain. In so many developed countries, there are those crucial moments that seem to be breaking those charts and de decoupling productivity with earnings. And what is AI going to do for this? Like, It could be this unique opportunity to close the gap. But instead of saving your job, AI is making your boss richer. It's capitalizing on your time, your health, and your sanity. Now, I've been digging through the causes, through the origins of these breaks, understanding these charts and what created these gaps in the first place to see if there's any chance that we can leverage AI to bring these closer together. Now, here's a crazy story that I honestly had a hard time believing. In 1913, Henry Ford installed the first moving assembly line in one of his plants. Now, manufacturing time gets cut from 12 hours per car to one hour and 33 minutes, the very definition of disrupting productivity. And Ford decides to reward his plant workers by doubling their salary. The end. Wait, wait, hold on, let's, let's unpack this. Now Ford's plant workers could build a car in one eighth of the time after this. So should they now be paid eight times more? That would be a bit naive, of course, because the cost of making a car is not one eighth of what it used to be. It's just the labor section that got reduced. But other people would argue that they're doing the same amount of work, the same type of work, the same amount of hours as before, then why would you need to pay them more? I'm sure many managers today would be on that boat. But why did Henry Ford give them a race? Was it altruism? or was it a business calculation? Well, it's kind of a cycle. A new technology boosts productivity, makes everything more profitable, and in Ford's story, that meant salary raises. Better salaries mean more productive employees, less turnover, which was kind of becoming a problem for Ford back then. But also, these better paid employees can now buy the cars that the company makes, which means more profits for the company. Not to mention the company's reputation improves. They have happier employees and people, therefore, buy more stuff from their brand. So altruism or just business calculation? I think it's honestly perfectly fair to say both. And more crucially, both Ford and his employees benefited from this. He got the bigger cut, but he's the founder, right? So was the 2X increase fair? Should it be more, should it be less? We can argue all day about that, but this chart proves that there was some fairness to how things were working back then, up until this point, which I'm gonna get to. Now, were the bosses nicer back then? Was it some rule or some tax? Was, was it the market? I think all of them. Like, There's no one law that forces you to peg profits to salaries, but there are protections. And a lot of those protections got put up in place after the Great Depression. In the US, for example, the most important one came in 1938 with the Fair Labor Standards Act. This is the law that set a federal minimum wage, established the 40 hour work week and required overtime pay if you went over that. This helped produce a really a golden age of optimism, good wages, good spending, good economy, a baby boom, and economy growth. So what the fuck happened here? And more critically, what will AI do to this gap? Okay, so now let's make sure that we are on the same page about what this chart means. This is an index of how much value US dollar value of goods and services each worker is creating for the economy. And there is a boost here, you can see it from post-war technology, highways, trucks, infrastructure. There's another boost around here from computers. That's a very visible bump in the late 90s. And then there's a slump right around here, which I'm gonna get to. But the whole thesis of AI is that now we can do more, right? That's because now we have our chatbots and our little AI-powered SaaS tools. Click up AI Note Taker. Sana AI. AI Optimized. Hat. Notion AI. Slack AI. Conversational AI. AI-powered search engine. Just like in Ford Cycle, AI could suddenly become this kickstart of a new cycle of prosperity. Because we trust our employees to use AI this way, right? Yeah, no, of, of course not. I'm an employer and I don't trust myself to do that. There isn't a single protection in place today that shields workers from how AI can change their work. And the reason why has to do with that slump I mentioned earlier. 
chart. Now, this is the percentage version of the same chart that I showed you earlier. Same idea, but instead of seeing the value in dollars of our productivity, we're seeing the accumulated growth of that number. And then there's this other line. It's the accumulated growth in salaries adjusted for living costs. Again, employees are more productive, but those benefits are not trickling down to them. And this mess seems to start right around the 70s. Now, if we add an unemployment line to this chart, we can start to see kind of where this mess originated. And it all has to do with power, where specifically, your boss's power. Now, if, you, if I think individually, AI has made my individual work incredibly more efficient. The problem is that it's given companies an unbalanced amount of power over their teams. And I'm gonna get to this in a sec, but one key learning tool that I've been using to just improve the way I use AI is HubSpot's complete guide to Claude AI. It includes full on prompt guides, including the setup command, the documents to upload the best practices to get Claude to actually do useful work and not just like answer trivia questions. And AI isn't going away. So the smartest thing that you can do, I think, is learn to make it work better for you. And one of my favorite resources in this guide is this prompt library section. It's not just one few liners, paragraphs that you can paste. It actually walks you through how to set up Claude for things like writing sales copy, summarizing reports, or even managing your inbox. And it's just like plug and play. If you're not constantly experimenting with new workflows, you will get left behind. And this guide is, I think, one of the best starting points that I've found. Now go grab it, it's completely free. You can use the link below. Now let's go back in time on that chart we were using. Because the 70s were this brutal decade. Two oil crises, stagflation, which is inflation's nastier, meaner cousin. And this crisis meant that everybody had to tighten their belts, right? It means that everybody has to work a little harder, right? Because otherwise you risk losing your job. And don't get me wrong, I run a tech company. This channel is really just our side hustle, in case you didn't know. But tight belts are the norm for tech startups. The whole premise of a startup is that you work harder, you have to work harder to beat the competition. And if you sign up for one, you're kind of expected to play by those rules. But I'm gonna get back to this in a sec. But most people don't work for startups and definitely not in the 70s. Now in this decade, the minimum wage lost 25% of its value. A lot of standardized salaries were lost. The percentage of private workers in a union started a clear decline. Airlines, trucks, and telecom, they all got deregulated. And, and the crisis hit everyone, but employees came out much weaker and employers came out stronger than ever. And that chart might not have been obvious in the 90s what was gonna happen, but it's hard to argue against something that happened in that decade. And on top of removed worker protections, two laws, I believe had a profound impact in all of this. So first, in 1982, SEC Rule 10B-18 made it so much easier for companies to buy back shares. It was a lot harder back then, a lot of bureaucracy, a lot of hoops, a lot of regulation you had to go through to buy back shares for a company. So this pool of profits that companies had often got reinvested. And a lot of that reinvestment ended up in their employees' pockets. But now you could easily convert this into shareholder value. And you could pay it in dividends, but Companies figured out that stock buybacks could be so much more profitable because America is so obsessed with the stock market. We made a whole video about that. Buybacks are so good for a company's stock performance that companies now go and borrow money to buy back stock. And in 1997, buybacks surpassed dividends as the dominant way US firms returned cash to shareholders. Who wants profits when you have Wall Street? And second, because of tax breaks. Tax breaks that disproportionately benefited the higher income tiers. This idea of reducing taxes during a recession makes a lot of sense. And it must have been easy to get support for this law, but who really stood to benefit from these new rules were the richest tiers. If you made the 1979 equivalent of $200,000 a year as an individual, income above $200,000 would be taxed at 55%. Today, that individual would pay just 32%. Income above $600,000 used to be taxed at 70%. But now, well, suddenly your boss sees this very direct extra percentage benefit for keeping that raise for themselves versus making it trickle down for the rest of the company. And this reduced tax revenue not only widens the productivity gap, but also the income gap. And that break, by the way, didn't happen in Europe. And compensation versus productivity remained closely pegged for many more years. Now, there, there's a very complex mix of reasons for that. It takes us multiple videos to cover it. But the point is that whatever combination of things happened in the US in the 70s made worker benefits take a turn for the worse. And so this kind of gives us a new cycle, right? Crisis triggers a productivity boost from employees. Not that they're more productive, they're just probably spending more hours. But if there's a crisis out there, you 
put the extra effort, you don't want to lose your job. So productivity increases, potentially with a smaller team. Employers can see the benefits of that extra profit eventually. But because we're in a crisis, there's no need to change salaries. There's no power to the employees to renegotiate because we're in a crisis. But surely a crisis doesn't last forever, right? It's only temporary. Right? The job prospects for recent graduates are down significantly from a year ago. The unemployment rate for recent grads reached 5.8% in March. Nearly one in four Americans are considered functionally unemployed. The thing is, companies have gotten really good at extending those temporary measures, either because they bridge their narrative to a new crisis or with this idea of productivity gospel. This idea of the 10x engineer, the mythical programmer, 10 times as productive as a normal one. Stallions. Each one more magnificent than the last. The business hero of this ultra productive, always busy executive answering emails at 10 p.m. or working through weekends. No one has ever changed the world by working only 40 hours a week. These big tech offices are designed so that you build your life inside them, in the end so that you don't really leave work. And this is rewarded behavior today in the workplace, but when you bring AI into the mix, it creates a perfect storm. So the tech world seems to agree that today there are two very obvious, very powerful uses for large language models in the workplace that can actually replace a lot of what people do or used to do. One is customer support, all around customer support, customer success, low tiers, sales rep interactions. And two, it's coding. GitHub Copilot is an AI pair programmer that we built to help. Copilot, any person can now build software in any human language. Okay, let's give Pod Code some context about the event so it can make the right implementation decisions. Codex actually helped me begin the integration of Codex on the ChatGPT iOS app. And so let's combine this with the reality of today's workplaces. Let's say big tech, for example. Venture funding dried out post COVID, right? We have this imminent bubble, we have the economy, we have tariffs, as many as half Half a million tech workers were laid off in 2023, 2024. Meta closing down Bay Area offices and thousands of tech layoffs. Amazon has reportedly cut about 27,000 jobs since 2022. Microsoft eliminating 300 more jobs just weeks after cutting thousands. There's your crisis. Now those who remain need to work a little harder, right? They need to be more productive. No salary changes, obviously, because we're in a crisis. And then AI comes into the mix. But in this cycle, AI is not a tool to make your life easier. It's another whip. It's less power to the employee. I recommend being in the office at least every weekday. 60 hours a week is the sweet spot of productivity. Now that's an extract of an email from Sergey Brin, one of the co-founders of Google, sent to the Google AI team earlier this year. Google is in a bit of a crisis too. LLM competitors are creeping out on their turf for the first time in decades. But Where's the overtime pay? Where is the work-life balance at 60 plus hours per week? Google is not a startup anymore, but they can get away with this new policy that applies to tens of thousands of engineers. A 2024 survey by DHR Global found that eight in 10 white collar workers felt burnt out. These are the workers who should be reaping the benefits of all this AI tools and automation. Callouts of the word burnout on Glassdoor reviews are on an all time high. Where is the promised paradise of AI productivity? Well, people are producing more, but somebody else is taking the benefit. AI is not here for your job yet. It's here to take your raise and the guardrails to protect workers from this have long been gone. That is what we need. Guardrails against overworking teams. Guardrails so that no matter your salary, your position, your fancy office perks, the expected work week is 40 hours, not 60. I'm not against progress. I'm not even against AI. Like I actually love how AI tools make me much more productive. This technology is here and pretending that it doesn't exist is not a solution. So I attended this tech startup conference last week and every single speaker Every startup founder is talking about AI either in how they're implementing into their products or into their operations, their processes, their teams. I don't think it's an evil AI takeover because I think in practice, the new rules are very simple. Just don't hire new people as you normally would. First, see if there's a way you can make your existing team more productive, automate stuff, extract more value out of them. This is a basic, a good and fair business practice as long as the guardrails are there. We can't pretend that AI tools aren't here. We need to use them, I think we need to leverage them, but a broader change, much broader change is needed to understand that laying off people and then consolidating everything into a single 80 plus hour worker is not a reasonable path 
to the future, not to the company, nor to the world. Now, when you're starting a company, there is no way around a 12 hour workday. I think that's what you sign up for as a founder. You have to catch up to your competition. You have no money. That's how it is. And our company would not be here if many of us, many people in our team hadn't pulled a fair share of all nighters. Startups are painful, but companies can't pretend to be startups forever, especially when managers exert power over hundreds or maybe thousands of people. As founders or as business operators, we just can't trust ourselves to be the ones closing the gap in these charts. That 80s revolution, that idea to leave the worker salaries to the forces of the market has just backfired again and again, year over year. And we are headed towards this future where half of the people aren't needed because the other half are just using AI to do twice their work. But we can do better. France, Belgium, Ireland, Germany, Australia, all these countries have implemented right to disconnect protections for any company over 50 employees. South Korea capped its max work week at 52 hours, including overtime. Now these are the protections that help keep these charts in balance. In the US, these protections don't exist. They're left to the companies to decide, to the market, and then they become benefits, right? Benefits that the company decides if they give them to you or not, which even if you're getting them, kind of leaves the company with that extra power to suddenly demand more of you because they're giving you these things. Employee protection should be the law much more now than ever. We no longer live in a world where Henry Ford would double the salaries of all of his employees thanks to this new innovation that we just came up with. The Henry Fords of today are laying off staff, piling up more work on top of the remaining ones, and just using AI to manage the load. We don't need to fear the AI tools themselves. We need to fear the companies that use this revolution to just squeeze us dry. Now, if you enjoy this video, you should watch our episode on how tech billionaires are also using their power to remove even more guardrails from how the world works today. Catch you on the next one.